How's it going, guys? Welcome back to the You Know Adam Sang podcast. It's your host, Adam Sang, and we get to talk to people, uh, talk about passions and all things business on this show. Today, I'm joined by Shai Wartz, who is the quarterback of the Georgia Southern Eagles. <laughs> nice to meet you. Welcome to the show. Appreciate you for having Fantastic. me. Fantastic. Uh, Shai, so uh, I guess let's take it back. Um, let's take it back to the beginning. How how did you become the quarterback of the Georgia Southern Eagles? Ah, uh, long story, long story. Uh, so I didn't actually get my first offer um, to my 11th grade year in high school. Um, it was the local college, uh, Newberry College. Um, you know, I was super excited when I first got it. Uh, it was after a big uh, win on a Friday night. I remember going in um, the next day to their game, uh, talking to the coaches, and, and they offered me my scholarship. Um, I immediately texted my big brother and I was like, bro, they just offered me my first scholarship. I was super excited. Man, you know, he was happy for me. He was like, I'm, I'm happy for you, but you know, we, we can do better than that. Okay. And, uh, so from then on, it was, it, it's go time. I got the first one. So now I, I know I can get more. Um, you know, the recruiting start really started to pick up for me. Um, Georgia Southern came in the picture and a lot more other schools. I don't want to get into all that, but, sure. um, so I ended up committing to Georgia Southern, got here first year, miserable. Uh, I was miserable. Um, did not want to be here at all. Um, was trying to go home as much as possible really? every weekend. Um, and uh, after the first, my first fall and going into the spring, I was able to compete for the starting job. And you know, it kind of, it kind of the switch. I kind of flipped the switch. Um, and I, I was all in. Um, I, I was just ready to, to to be the guy, to be the quarterback. And uh, that's what I did. And I won the job. And I've been starting ever since. So, so let's talk about that. So you said when you first got here, mm -hmm. you actually didn't enjoy it too much. No. What, no. what were the aspects that kind of like made that, I guess, position or mm -hmm. what you were doing unenjoyable? What, uh, what was it? It was really just the, <laughs> the staff, really. Mm -hmm. um, I, I didn't commit to that coaching staff, um, but I was committed to the school. Uh, I liked everything about Southern. Um, I remember coming to, to the games as a, a senior in high school. Um, and I loved it. The atmosphere was, you know, it was a football town. I didn't want to go somewhere where um, football wasn't important. Like, cause I come from a school that, you know, the town shut down on Friday night. So, okay. Um, that's something I wanted. And I, I seen that tradition. I seen that winning and I wanted to be a part of it. So I decided to come here, um, off, off of that. And so when the staff left, I committed to coach Fritz, by the way, um, mm -hmm. committed to coach Fritz. And then he ended up leaving, going to Tulane. Um, he wanted me to come to Tulane, but, uh, I wasn't trying to go to New Orleans. And then Coach Summers came and, you know, that whole ordeal happened. And I just I just wasn't happy. Um, I just didn't feel like I was being treated fairly. Um, and, you know, it's a it's a it's a super long story, man. But I just I just was not happy. I was trying everything in my power to just stay positive, but it was so hard. It was probably mm -hmm. one of the lowest points in my life for sure. Um, was thinking about transferring. Um, but things end up working out and, you know, like I said, I'm still Well, what's excited. important is that you're happy now, right? Yeah. And I think that that's yeah. the key. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, a lot of times when we have dreams and things that we want to achieve, there's always these, uh, challenges ahead right. of us, right? right? And, you know, so what type of advice would you give to someone out there that maybe isn't as satisfied and, right. you know, what they're doing day to day? Right. Um, just, just try to stay positive. I could, uh. I could have handled that situation so much better than what I did. Um, I just shut down really. Like I did, I came in to to the FOC, the facility. That's what we call it, the FOC. Um, came in there every day just with a bad body language, bad mm -hmm. attitude, and I I didn't see the silver lining in nothing. Like I was always always just down. Like I did not want to be there. Um, so my advice to to somebody who was just going through that is just try to find the silver lining in everything because I could have easily had to take a different route. Like Georgia Southern is division one. Like I'm a division one athlete. Like it's people who would kill to be in the position I'm in. So at least be grateful for that. And I wasn't because I felt like I, I had deserved so much more. I had sacrificed so much mm. to to get so much and I just wasn't seeing it then. Um I just had to stay patient. Just had to wait my turn. And um Again, things worked out for the you better. Got it now. So, uh, talk talk to me a little bit about kind of like that transfer mm -hmm. of uh, energy that happened when Coach 
uh, Lunsford stepped in, mm-hmm. right? I mean, yeah. obviously, he was able to really excite the entire community. Right. I, I don't think it's just the football players. Mm-hmm. I think it's everybody on a whole. Yeah. You know, you see him out there doing this crazy thing, you know, with the <laughs> chairs. Tell me about that. Right. Like, what, what is that? Like, C- Coach Lunsford, man, he, he a different dude, man. He just brings a different energy. He is a positive dude. Um, and I feel like I connect it with, so well with him because he was a major part of me even coming to Georgia Southern still after mm-hmm. the old staff had left. Um, so he was, like I said, just a major part of me coming here. Um, the energy he bring every day, he try to always be a positive dude. Sometimes it, it can get to like coach, like, bro, like, come on now, we just lost. Like, how you, you know what I'm saying? So, um, but it, it's always good to have a, have a coach like that who who always positive. Um, so for him to come in and, and take over the way he took over us going from two and ten to ten and three, um, mm-hmm. his first season being the like the actual head coach for a whole year, um, I know that was good for him and his family. It was also good for us to get our confidence back as a, as a program. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it, it was good to have him as our head coach. Uh, one of the things right now I want to do is kind of roll it back. So we're talking about a lot of you know during college and that mm-hmm. sort of thing. Take me to like high school, middle school. Did you did you always know that football was something that was going to be a large part of your life right absolutely um really it was baseball at first okay. um baseball was my first love uh that's what i wanted to do that's why i wanted to go to school to do um but in the high school i found that they they didn't give out full rides in baseball so when i found out that and then i found out football does it's like it's no way i'm finna let my parents pay for college so mm. i just decided to, to choose football and that's the route i took but going back to early on and in my earlier years um Growing up and just seeing my older brothers play, seeing the impact that they had on the field, seeing how people just gravitated towards them because they played the sport um, and just working out with them and just falling in love with the process, falling in love with the grind. um, That's what really made me like fall in love with the game. Mm -hmm. Um, There was a time I I felt out in love with the game, but, you know, that's what uh, originally started it, like just being with my older brothers and working out and just Fall in love with the grind. Uh, how many of your family members uh, played football? Uh, let's see. My my old, my two older brother played. Um, my other my other older brother played too, but he didn't he didn't play that long. Um, my dad played a little bit. Oh, he did. Um, yeah, I had an uncle who played in the NFL. I got another uncle who played. Um, he was pretty good, and he he tell me all the time his stories about high school and stuff like that. Um, so I got a lot of people in my family who play who play ball who who are pretty good. It's very inspiring when you hear those stories, right? Of, of maybe people that are playing in the NFL, right. and like you know how they did it, so forth and mm-hmm. so on. Um, you know, uh, for you, you know, when you had those conversations with them about kind of like you know the 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 things that they went mm-hmm. through, um, did you feel like you had a place to mm-hmm. be able to do that? Like, is that the future for you? Like, is that what you hope to achieve? Right. I, I think the conversations with my older brother is really like, his name is Man, by the way. Man, uh, okay. So the conversations with him um, is just really what kept fueling it, kept mm-hmm. fueling it, kept fueling it. Because a, a big part of what I do and why I do it is my family. And so just him and him being driven the same way. Like we trying to feed our family. So mm. uh, that's what still pushed me to this day. That's my why, that's why I do everything that I do is for my family. So mm-hmm. um, to be able to, to make them proud and to, to, to be able to give them the life that I feel like they deserve and that they always want it um, is what, what keeps pushing me. In so would drive. you say, what would you say, sorry, to, to, didn't mean to cut you, you off, good. but would you say that, you know, when you step onto the field, mm-hmm. you're really out there playing for them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm not sure. It's it's a little subtle. Um, so before every game, I, I write on my tape, uh, on my wrist, or like on my towel, "Feed your fam" or "Feed your fam." Um, and that's something that's that true. I just like really play by, live by, whatever. Like everything I do, no matter what, whether it's business, football, whatever in life, is I gotta make sure my family's straight. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. Uh, you know, family is a powerful mo- motivator. Uh, t- tell me a little bit about your family. Like, uh, how many members of the family? Uh, I don't know the exact number, but it's a, it's a, it's a lot. Um, mm-hmm. Really, I got a really close knit group. My mom and dad, uh, they split when I was a, a younger. Um, really raised by my granny. Uh, that's somebody who, that's a, that's my everything. That's, mm-hmm. that's my baby. My granny, uh, my auntie, uh, uncles, man. I, Glove from everybody, really. I, I got a village. Um, got a village. I even got a tattoo okay. right here. It takes okay. a village to raise a child. Um, and then I got you know, that Porsche tattooed on my arm. But yeah, man, I'm a I'm a real big family guy. That's important. Sure. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, so take me a little bit further down. So we, we kind of like discussed about, you know, your your first offer. Mm -hmm. uh, you were super excited about that, how mm -hmm. that kind of like really impacted right. you. You said that, okay, now that I got the first one in the bag, more will come. Right. Uh, then you came to Georgia Southern. You kind of like, you know, tra uh, traversed through that. Mm -hmm. um, there was an incident that happened that really, I, I think, had a lasting impact on you. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about that? So, uh, man, that was... <laughs> another crazy low moment in my life. Uh, mm -hmm. So headed back to school for the beginning of camp last year, the tw before the 2019 season, uh, got pulled over through through a small town in South Carolina called Saluda, Saluda County. Um, was pulled over uh, and the officer said I had cocaine on the hood of my car. Um, and I was just like, bro, no, like we're not even finna do this. Like you, I know you, you joking or something. And you know he was serious, uh, so I ended up going to jail. Had to spend eighteen hours in, in the Saluda County Jail, and that was that was rough. Like I, I did, I do not see how people, um, like be living in jail like for, for the rest of their life. Like it's people that's doing life like gotta be in jail for the rest of their life. Um, and eighteen hours was enough. Like I never, I never want to go back to jail. Um, but yeah, like I said, man, it was it was definitely a low point. Um, just going through all that, that that whole situation revealed things in me that I didn't even know was in myself. Like um, anxiety is very real. Um, it, it definitely it definitely is. Uh, I was that's when I was first like introduced to it. Like it was really happening. I didn't really know what's going on. Didn't really know how to to deal with the emotions that I was I was feeling. It was kind of weird. Um, and then not only having to deal with that, it was kind of like okay, so that happened, right? And then, okay, now it's fall camp, so the season's approaching. Like it's it's here, and you know, and I'm the I'm the quarterback of a of a of a team that like if you don't win, but listen, like <laughs> it's 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 gonna be trouble. You know what I'm saying? So so that pressure come now. I'm gotta worry about okay, like is do people think I got out of that situation because of who I am, or mm. do they really think I'm innocent? Like did I really have cocaine on my car? Because it, it was some stories. It's, like headlines that came out that say it was in my car. So like now I'm thinking like do people think it was in my car, mm -hmm. on my car? And there's just so many stories that like I never really got the chance to really just tell what really happened and tell, you know what I'm saying? So now going into the season, back to the season, is dealing with that pressure coming off a of 10 and 3 season and just feel like I gotta perform, like I gotta make it happen. Like it just gotta be the year. And like I was in a sense like pressing a little too much and then we get to the LSU game and I get hurt. So mm. I played 17 plays um, after coming off a, a great offseason. I feel good and got some weight on me. And, man, like, it's 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 bad. Like, I just feel like, bro, every, like I'm my back against the wall. Like, things aren't going good. So then I come back. I, I missed, like, two, three games. And I come back and, you know, we, we lose that game. And I'm, yeah, bro, like, come on, man. Like, like, what is it? Like, bro, come on. Like, Okay, now the seasons continue to go on, continue to go on, and you know I'm I'm playing okay, but I'm not having a season now that I want to have, and it's it's not so much of my ability. It's I'm in my head, like I'm I'm second guessing myself on mm. the field. I'm a second guess to throw here, or throw there. I'm second guess to make this read or that read, and it's just like I'm in my head so much, um, and, and it that whole situation, like it took a toll on me. It, it really did, and I never really. Like wanted to to talk about to talk about it in a moment because I didn't want people to feel like I was blaming what had happened on, that. on, on, on you know what I'm saying on the incident. But there that, that's real life, that's reality. Like I'm like I'm fighting this in my head, like and this it's real and mental health. Like that's something that I ain't, I didn't I'm not gonna say I took it for granted. Like and I, cause I, because I seen how it affected other people, but it never happened to me, so I didn't like realize to the the effects that it could have on somebody like until it happened to me. And when it happened that 2019 season, man, I was just, it was rough. I think oftentimes, you know, we don't realize uh, situations until they happen to us. Right, right, exactly. Once it happens to you, you're like, oh, okay, this is what it I, feels like. what it feels like, exactly. Um, you mentioned something in there that you never got the opportunity to kind of like say what exactly happened that night. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, this is a great opportunity for you for to sure. do, that, do now. Mm -hmm. So what what happened that night? You know, um, take me through, like, the feelings that you experienced. Like, mm -hmm. when you when you got there, I mean, uh, did you get pulled over just because, like, 
I mean, they were just pulling random cars over mm-hmm. or, or what happened? No, so he said I was speeding. And uh, so- Do you feel like you were speeding? I really don't even know. I I think I told him no when like when mm-hmm. he I was like I don't I don't think so. Um, and then he couldn't like whatever. I'm not even gonna get into that because it's still kind of sure, like, sure, open, whatever, of whatever I said. But yeah, but let's talk about how he was talking to me when he pulled me over. Mm. Um, bro, it was like blatant disrespect. Like, mm. bro, I'm still a human. Like, I don't even know why you mad. Like, why are you mad? Like, cause I oh I knew why he I know why he mad because I didn't pull over like right when he got behind me. So Saluda, it's a small town. It's, you know, it got some history behind it, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Um, so I didn't want to, I didn't want to pull over right where I was at. It was a long road. This road probably like 20 miles of like, just really dark. Like it's a few houses here and there, but it, it's a dark road. Kinda so, iffy, right? right. So when yeah, he got yeah. behind me, I'm like, bro, listen, I'm not finna pull over right here. So I called on one. I'm like, listen, ma'am, can you please tell the officer that's behind me? I'm not running. I'm not trying to avoid him. Nothing. I, I see him. I'm acknowledging him. But can I get to some light? Okay. And that's what I did. So tried to get to some light. Um, and it really was almost there before another cop pulls in front of me. Um, so I just go ahead and pull over because I didn't want to wreck my car, obviously. And then he get to the car, start, you know, and he immediately got an attitude. So berating you. Right. So we we going through all that, and you know, I just. And I and I and I'm scared on the inside, but on the outside, I'm I'm like I'm got this face on, I'm like, but bro, I'm scared because like sure. this this is a police officer. He got a gun, like he already talking me crazy. Like it's dark, it's dark. Yeah, you know, it's a it's a it's a few other policemen out there, but they don't look like me, so I don't know how you know. Sure. So I don't know how that go. We all know what's what's going on in the world right now. Um, but yeah, it it was scary. It was scary. I think it kind of it kind. It kind of made me feel like less of a man in that moment because I couldn't really exp- like express myself how I wanted to because I know if I did and the things that I wanted to say to him, like it probably it would wouldn't. Bad. Yeah, it probably would have been bad. Yeah. So it was a, it was definitely a long night. And then I'm 18 hours in, in the Saluda County Jail. Like I said, I don't I don't wish that jail on nobody. Yeah. Nobody. So like I guess like through your mind, you know, when they when they finally so obviously there's there's something that must have mm-hmm. happened like during during this time, but like, right. you know, when when he when you when the moment that he said that, okay, well, you know, you are going to jail, I mean, right. I guess what Ooh, did you my heart drop like <laughs> immediately, right? <laughs> like in my stomach, I'm like, well, I'm gonna lose my scholarship. I ain't gonna play this season. Like there's just so many scenarios going through my head because it's like I'm thinking about how he gonna like or how the the media and everything gonna portray this like because I, I know like it's not gonna be like oh the cocaine was found on the hood of his car like or the uh, accused cocaine whatever however you want to say it was found on the hood of my car it was gonna say in my car or at least something like sure. that so I'm trying to play like bro like they not gonna believe me and I'm just I'm just going the whole 18 hours I'm I'm trying to think like bro like what's gonna happen and so I get out and, you know, I grab my phone back and I see all these missed calls, I see all these text messages and things like that. And I'm like, bro, it's out. Like, everybody know now. Like, mm-hmm. So first thing I do, um, my mama told me that he, she had already talked to Coach Lunsford. So that's the first thing I do. I call my coach. I'm like, coach, what's up? Blah, blah, blah. I'm talking to him and I'm telling him, telling him what's happening. And, you know, he he behind me. Um, I think, yeah, TK was still here at the time. So I talked to TK too, talked to Coach the best. And, you know, they they believe me. They, they believe me from the jump. So it wasn't. Like nothing like that, but it was still hard. It was still hard to to know that people um probably are just thinking like oh, I sell drugs or I do cocaine yeah. or something like that. So it was definitely it was definitely weird. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, I I know that Coach uh, Lunsford. I mean, he made a public statement, really mm-hmm. kind of like always just behind you, right? And I and I think that speaks to you know his ability to. Uh, lead his team right I mean because he puts his faith in his players and making sure that you right. know, they they are doing what they are supposed to mm-hmm. um how has that impacted your outlook like you know um race is a very kind of like prevalent thing right now right um how do you think that experience really changed your perception of you know what's going on it made me more passionate about it really mm-hmm. um just talking about it um speaking up about it is people who innocent people who lost their, lost their lives to a white cop that yeah. looked like me you know mm-hmm. what i'm saying for no reason just mm-hmm. because they felt superior like you had no reason to have your neck your knee on this man's neck for 
eight minutes, nine minutes, however long it was. Like, it, you had no reason to do that. That's right. And now his daughter got to, you know, go through the rest of her life without her dad. And so for me, it just kind of like, man, I got to do something. Like, I got to, you know, and I'm not a very vocal person. Like, I don't like like talking in front of large crowds. It's not something I do. Like, the, the largest crowd I would talk to is like my teammates, like in front of in front of a team meeting or something like that. So, um, it really just made me want to talk about it, um, shed light to all the the wrong things that are going on in the world because a lot of times we only see the things that are happening on social media, on mm. Twitter, and Instagram, like the videos that get posted. But it's so many more situations that take place and don't get uh, the the publicity that a lot of these other situations have and so um for for example like when i was like trying to find lars and stuff to represent me for you know what i'm saying for the case or whatever um and i had call, lars calling my phone just telling me like it was it's, it was one lady in, in some state who who did like two years because a stress ball was opening her car and like this the white stuff was coming out and it tested positive for a, a controlled substance but she didn't have the money for a good lawyer to get her out of that situation. So oh she had God. to wait for the results to cut some kind of crazy stuff. It's like, bro, like what? Like people, two years of your life and you innocent. Like it's just stuff like that that made me realize like I got to do something. I got to use my voice somehow to, you know what I'm saying? No matter if it's how big or small the change may be, I got to do something. What is the message that you want to get out out there in the world? Right is right, wrong is wrong. Like simple as that. Like you could, you can say skin color, and that play a major a major role in it. But right is right, and wrong is wrong. I don't feel like nobody should be treated the way like how how we have been seeing on cameras mm-hmm. um, these past few months, like the Breonna Taylor. Like you, how? Like mm-hmm. how does that happen? Like no, that should never happen. And just so many other other instances like it's wrong it's completely wrong and so what I tried to do and like I, I'm not sure if you was there it was kind of like a s- small little protest or whatever um something I said in the in my talk to the crowd was like no matter how big or how small you think your voice is use it and that's what I want to continue to to tell people like and especially athletes because I know a lot of times that we we get in this box and we like we Bro, we can't say that. We can't. We can't do mm-hmm. that. Like, why not? We humans. Like, we athletes, but we, bro, we humans at the end of the day. Like, why can't you speak up? Why can't you say what you believe or fight for what you believe in? Like, why not? Because you're an athlete. Like, no. Like, football is what I do, not who I am. And mm, that's huge. That's that's something that I want. Um, really, every athlete to 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 think about like not just football players, baseball, basketball, softball, whatever, like use your voice. Like, cause you got a major platform, like use it. So I think that's what, other than what I said at the beginning, right is right, wrong and wrong. Like more so towards athletes, like I'm a quarterback at a, you know what I'm saying? Not trying to brag or boast or nothing like that, but like I'm a quarterback at division one, division one school. If I feel like if I, if somebody see me, if another athlete see me, taking the initiative to do something and stand up for what I believe in and fight for what I believe in, then they can do it as well. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. It does. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a huge message. I think not only athletes, but everybody in the world, right? right. We all have right. voices. Right. right? All, all everybody. Have, right. And, and we all have the ability to kind of, I guess, make change. Yeah. Um, you know, for you, one of the questions I have is like, you know, what do you think, it, like, with all this happening in the world right now, mm-hmm. like, what do you think is the solution? Because everybody's looking for that, right? right? Like, yeah. you know, there's so many challenges. There's so many different things that are happening out there that, um, you know, we we feel like we don't have any control. Mm-hmm. Um, what should the conversation really be about? So that's really a that's really a, a good question, a tough question. As well, I don't I don't think there is just like one solution that you could like say to change everything or fix everything. I think. It should start with, I know people probably get tired of hearing this, conversations. Those hard conversations have to be had in order to change someone, uh, someone's perception of just how they see things. Because, like, for instance, me and you, we had two different 
we was raised two different ways. Mm-hmm. Probably, you know what I'm saying? Seeing the whole, you probably seen some things I never seen. I probably seen some things you never seen. So um, to start those tough conversations, they got to be had. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be hard. It's definitely going to be hard. Like I had a conversation with Coach Lumsford. It was a hard conversation, but it had to be had. Um, and then not only talking about it, but being about it. Because in the beginning of this whole like social injustice movement, it was a it was a lot of talk like let's do this let's let's have this group let's make this comedian let's do this let's do that then you know months go by go? like where does it go yeah. like you know what I'm saying it's gotta it's gotta be consistency it got it's it's gotta be and a, a big another big thing to to say is it's, it's it's a marathon not a sprint it's gonna take time like people who look like me we've been oppressed for over 400 years like mm-hmm. it's not going to be something that's going to be fixed in a few months or even a year or a sure. few years it's going to some it's going to be something that's going to take time um we just got to continue to work at it with consistency and it's got to be something that you really want like anything in life like if you want this change if you want it to happen then it has to be consistent even myself like i gotta i gotta continue to educate myself um as far as like the things that's that i can do better or I can help bring to to light, you know what I'm saying? Does, does that make sense? It like, is I gotta I gotta continue to find ways and help um, others find ways as well. So mm-hmm. yeah, um, you know I I am a minority as well. You right. know, I grew up in Statesboro, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and I remember uh, distinctly. You know, there's times when you, you you're faced with things that you know are not so comfortable. Right. Um, you know, and, and one of the conversation pieces that, you know, I want to have is like, you know, you know, as a minority, mm-hmm. um, the experiences that your minority have versus minority have are quite different, mm-hmm. right? Uh, you know, Asians for whatever reason have been often called like the, uh, the model minority or whatever that means. I yeah. think it's like our parents <laughs> are like driving us to mm-hmm. continue to achieve, um, you know, for you kind of, I guess what, what what are the different things that we, the, the conversations that we can have um, mm-hmm. to help move the world forward? Because right. I think that that's kind of like what, what, what doesn't push us forward is mm-hmm. that we, we are not having the correct conversations. Right. It, I think it starts with being transparent. Mm-hmm. It, tries, it starts with being transparent. So like we in this room um, and say it's kind of like a, a, a round table talk. Yeah. Right. So it's me, you, and one of our Caucasian friends, and you know what I'm saying, just a, a mixture of culture. Like I said before, like I was brought up a different way than you were. That's you right. were brought up a different way than I were. So in order to understand the the I guess the the problem or the help find a solution to all of this is to understand each other. In order to in order for you to know like the words like talking to somebody who is white. <laughs> like the words you the, the words you say in order for you to know how that uh, affects me or how it makes me feel then i gotta tell you you gotta right. you gotta ask me like how did when somebody say the n-word how does it make you feel mm. and i'm gonna tell you like boy listen don't we ain't doing that don't That's don't right. do that you know what i'm saying so it, it gotta be like i said them hard conversation like and it's gonna be it's gonna be times where i may not agree with what you say you may not agree with what i say i might not agree with what he say or she say like it's that's the part of the conversation. So that's what I mean by those those tough, hard conversations. Like, and I mean like the questions that nobody want to ask, the mm. questions that nobody want to answer. Like, it got to be in order for it to to go the way it's supposed to. You know. Well, thank you so much for being like a spokesman for kind of like I guess you know for people to have voices. I mm-hmm. think that communication is such an important part of Good you word. know our culture. That you know that's how we kind of like meet all. That's how we move the ball forward. Right. right. Uh, I, I want to change uh, the conversation now to kind of like looking looking forward into, I guess, the future. Mm-hmm. Um, what is what is next for for you? The NFL. God's willing. God's willing. Yeah, man. I I've my whole life, man. Just it's been a process. It's been a journey, but I feel like it's here. I feel like it's time. Um, you know, it, like I said, God's willing though. I got other stuff that I'm, I'm working on as well. If, if if that ain't in God's plan, so um, you know, I definitely gonna have a I guess a, a bitter, sour taste in my mouth for a little bit if it if it don't work out the way that I always wanted it to. But you know, I, that's that's not gonna be it. 
Like mm-hmm. I told you before, football is what I do, not who I am. So I, I'm going to find a way to, to make sure that that we straight, my family straight. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, for you, uh, what does that process look like? So, I mean, is there, I guess, scouts that are being mm-hmm. sent out right now that right. are watching the games? What, what are they looking for? Yeah, so I, I'm really not sure how that process work, um, okay. really. I, I just, like, agents, I've been, you know, talking to a few agents, um, and, you know, things are they looking good. Um, so hopefully just throughout the season, just continue to, to play well, um, to, 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 to do what I do. Mm-hmm. Um, and let the chips fall where they may. That's right. That's mm-hmm. right. Um, you know, I, I think that that's a huge goal to accomplish. You know, for for you, um, you you have set your eyes on the NFL. I right. think that that's that's very that's very certain. But I I like how even though regardless of you know if the NFL thing happens or not, right. you have this core belief that no matter what, I'm going to take care of my family. And I, and I think that that is really what pushes you, Mm -hmm. you know, ahead of, ahead of everybody else. Um, you know, for our audience out there, I guess, you know, one of the, one of the final things that I have for you is, I mean, is there anything that you want to be able to say to everybody out there? What is the message that you want to bring to people? Hmm. I want to, I want to talk to the, to the athletes for a second. Um, because it's something that I, I struggle with a little bit and something that was, like always on my mind, kind of like what we just talked about, just the core belief of I'm gonna make a way no matter what. So up until my my junior year, kind of like when everything happened with you know with in Saluda, um, it was NFL, NFL, NFL. Like I thought about nothing else. Like and when football was taken away from me for about a, almost a week, I had to self reflect a little bit. I had to think like, what if what if I don't get a chance to go back? Then what? Like what I'm gonna do? Like I don't got no plan. Like I, I'm just been going into school, like taking classes. Like I don't, am I really even learning anything? Like, mm. or am I just trying to get good grades to stay eligible for football? Like, and during that time, I had like, what do I really want to do? And I always thought about real estate. Like, I, I like real estate, so okay. kind of got into it. Um, but back to what I was saying um, about the NFL. Like, my whole life, NFL, NFL, NFL. Then when it happened, I had to, like I said, have to, had to share for flip. And at that moment, I made a decision to, like, bruh, no matter what, like, I got to feed my family. Mm-hmm. Got to. So to all the athletes out there, like, don't put, I know y'all probably heard this saying before, like, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Like, you got to, you, you got to be flexible or just. Evolve. Like, yeah, evolution. like, you, yeah, you can't just. Put it all on one, like you, you can't, like, cause what if it don't work out? Then what? You, you stuck kind of back in square one, like. Mm-hmm. And I don't want my transition phase how it went, wherever that may come, like after the NFL or if the NFL don't work and I'm after college, I gotta go find whatever with, with real estate. Um, it, it gotta be a, a plan in place. Like I don't want to just be stuck. Like oh, I didn't make it to the NFL and I gotta go work a nine to five. Not saying nothing wrong working a nine to five sure. at all, but I just don't see myself working a nine to five in working for somebody else. Like, I want to be my own boss. That's something I pride myself on. That's Cause like, I'm I'm like, I consider myself like uh, a hustler. Like, mm-hmm. I, I I feel like I strive or I thrive the the best when it's like my back against the wall. And mm-hmm. it's like, it's, hey, I got to go out there and hunt or I'm gonna be hungry. Like, I got to make it happen. And that's why I feel like I thrive the best. Um, So, my advice to to all the athletes out there, man, listen, find what you want to do outside of your sport. Like, it got to be something. Like, don't plan on just, like, I'm going to go to the NFL, I'm going to make millions. Okay, the average span of an NFL career is like three to five years. So say I go to the NFL this year. I'm done with football at 28. Mm. What and happens gonna, after that? What happens after that? Like, and I just want to have things in place. I want to um, just – be able to, to to have a life outside of football because, like I said before, I'm gonna continue to go back to that. Football is what I do, not who I am. It's amazing, uh, Shaw. Thank you so much for your time. I really mm-hmm. appreciate the time that you spent with mm-hmm. us. Uh, I know that your schedule is extremely busy. <laughs> for sure. Um, best of luck to you. I look forward to seeing you in, in the NFL. For sure. uh, but even if that doesn't work out, I look forward to the career that you will have mm-hmm. uh, in everything that you do. But uh, thank you so much. I appreciate, I appreciate your time you. and appreciate uh, you. enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank cool, you. Man.